Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overall series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.2. I tried to upgrade to 1.1.3, but it seems like not all the mods are on the same page with that. You can't just take all the mods from 1.1.2 and expect them to work in 1.1.3, uh, more is the pity, because it seems like they fixed, uh, well they said that they fixed certain very important bugs, including one where the CPU and GPU rev up quite a lot, especially my GPU rev up quite a, quite a lot when you're in the space center scene and certain other things and there's a lot of CPU usage in the VAB. Uh, I'm hoping that they can optimize that a little bit because it's a bit annoying. In fact, uh, on this screen you may be able to hear my computer a bit because GPU revs up for unspecified reasons here and I would really like it to not do that. But uh, yeah, anyway, 1.1.3 uh, not quite ready with the realism overhaul mods yet. So that is the status of that. Otherwise, I will continue 1.1.2 until everything is good. So we are looking to either put a probe around the moon, do a geostationary satellite launch, or get a Kerbal past the speed of sound for a sustained period of time. These are things that we have contracts for. And I want to start unlocking technology because we've got quite a bit of science from our previous missions. And I think I'll go with mature supersonic flight here first because that might help with the getting a Kerbal past the speed of sound for a while, though obviously getting the Kerbal to orbit would also do that. Uh, that is a thing that I also want to aim for, so maybe basic capsules is a thing. I'm gonna unlock basic capsules, but that's gonna take 476 days, so not anytime soon. Uh, I really like these parts. Um, stage combustion is also very nice, uh, though I think we could do, I, I mean that's basically a proton right there. Uh, though NK9 I haven't seen before. That's interesting. Uh, I'm more of a NK15 type that's over here. That'll, that'll be a while. Okay, so... But the Astris engine is really helpful as an on-orbit engine because it doesn't have any uh, limitations on ignitions. And of course it's much more powerful than a 1 kilonewton thruster. So that is good, but before I spend 60 on that, let's take a look at everything else. Uh, we could get improved instrumentation, which is, I guess, better solar panel. Uh, do, do we have solar panels? Uh, I forget sometimes wh which, where I'm at. Mm, doesn't look like it. Yeah, it doesn't look like we have solar panels. So yeah, solar panels, sort of important. Let's research that. Okay, so that leaves us with 80. Basic solids, don't care about. Um, docking port, propellant only. That would be the start of bigger things. Uh, we don't really need better RCS ports though, and that seems to be what this is mainly offering. Second gem capsules, well, we'll just stick to basic capsules for now. Um, general construction, well, that gives us lunar rated heat shields. I really want those. But I sort of like the Astros engine. These others I can wait for, the RS-27 and all. But I feel like the Astros engine would be a good thing. Uh, do we get fuel lines at any point? Or do we have them already? I don't think so. Okay, so we've got quite a few things being unlocked. Our technology schedule is packed. I would say this is a fine order for things to occur in. Although, uh, maybe improved instrumentation first because of the solar panels. I don't think putting a satellite into geostationary orbit is really helpful unless you have solar panels. Upgrade points, uh, sure. I think uh, we need to speed up our R&D. So I'll spend all three available points there. Okay, taking a look at our contracts. Break the sound barrier is the only uh, normal one, and then maybe lunar orbit or achieve geostationary orbit. Lunar orbit is much more lucrative. Achieve ge geostationary orbit, not quite so much, though pretty good on completion, and eight years to do it. Uncrewed lunar landing, uh, well, we'll have to get into orbit first, so we might as well do that. Venus flyby. It would be a little bit tough to do right now. Until we prove that we can do lunar orbit, I don't want to go with Venus flyby or Mars. Uh, let's add some clocks, though. Transfer window for 
uh, Earth to Venus. I don't think we'll make that one though. And from Earth to Mars. That one is marginally more doable. Okay. So Mars flyby is there. It'll, uh, we have seven years to do it, but that's still an interesting requirement. Yeah, maybe seven years is a long time. Sure, Mars flyby, lunar orbit, geostationary orbit. Let's do all the things. Venus flyby though, well they give us eight years. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Science day from space around the moon? Sure. Surface, though, let's hold off on that. Alright, so now I've got quite a slate of possibilities. Let me go to VAB and see what I can build. Alright, so in an attempt to get into lunar orbit, I guess that'll be the first one I'll tackle. I have designed this. Uh, we have unlocked the the early controllable core which has a capacity of 0.2 tons which basically size this and uh, we've got hydrazine and we've got the one kilonewton thruster and orientation thrusters also configured to hydrazine so that is good and solar panels on one side the solar panels are not that heavy it's like 0 0.0003 tons so I didn't feel a particular need to counterbalance it I might be wrong we'll find out uh, but obviously it's better to have them just on one side, the side facing the sun, because they cost a lot and uh, also take a long time to build. So it increases the build time if you have more of those. Uh, I've noticed that they're particularly hard to build for some reason. Also they cost 300 apiece, so that's 1,200 right there. And that's out of a rocket cost of 7,332. So yeah, definitely don't want extra of that. Uh, so we did have uh, solar panels, these solar panels, but hopefully we'll get more efficient solar panels with the new technology. Okay, so obviously the coupler and then the Able Avionics package. And here we have the Agena vacuum engine, so introducing a lot of new things here. Uh, I've configured it for the configuration that allows two ignitions. So if you see here, uh, the current configuration has two ignitions, just in case. And it's got a surplus of delta V to get to the moon. Okay, two ignitions would also help us if we wanted to do a geostationary satellite. So hopefully we'll get to that. And we have a little bit of hydrazine here, 100 units for the RCS thrusters. And those RCS thrusters will also fine-tune the orbit uh, when it comes time to do that. Because it might be hard to do it with this very powerful engine. It is very powerful. It starts out at 2.51 thrust weight ratio and ends up... 8.68 so we don't want to be trying to do the fine adjustments with that okay so fairings and then we have two Thor avionics cores and that gives us a maximum capacity of 130 tons which this is well under and then I decided to just go with an Atlas rocket uh, so we've got the Atlas body we've got the LR-105 and then the LR-89s. I did this because the the tank cost is actually a lot cheaper than the Lancer. The Lancer uses the same engines except it doesn't uh, it also has the extra RD-0105. Now the question is whether this Atlas rocket can actually launch this payload. You can see 7386 it doesn't look like it can but you have to remember that the Atlas stages off these two outer engines. This is a decoupler. So it's going to get rid of those engines and only burn the center one. And then the delta V is a little bit different. If we burn the center one all the way, uh, that's only 7,997 though. So it's, I don't know. That seems a bit comp, well actually it's not, hold on. Um, let's say we put it far, far away. Ah, here we go. Uh, so it was getting confused. 9,160 is how much we have with just the center engine. Uh, is that enough? Probably not, I'd say. Probably not. Um, but it's complicated because of the way we're using the two booster engines, so I can't really tell unless we try it, which is the curious thing about the Atlas rocket. You really have to try it and see what its capabilities are. Um, we're ca trying to carry 2.8 tons to orbit is the goal, so hopefully it'll work out. 
If not, we'll have to use a different rocket, but it'll be interesting to try the Atlas for once. I've called the satellite trinket for no apparent reason, I, it just popped into my head. So let's build, and we'll see how long that takes. It looks like it's going to take 134 days. By that time, our mature supersonic flight will be already complete. Why don't I, while that's completing, try to build the aircraft that will get our Kerbal to the speed of sound for more than a minute, break the sound barrier, and try that contract out. So on to the SPH, which who knows what kind of shape it's in. Alright, so what I have here is a very simple and straightforward design. I've tried to keep it exceedingly simple so that FAR is utterly happy with it at Mach 1 and of course also at sea level at lower Mach numbers. Um, and it should be okay if we dump all the fuel in the main tank. Whoops. Don't want to do that. Hold on. Uh, dump all the fuel. Hmm. That's a little bit close. So we'll move the wing a little bit further back. That should be okay. But as you can see, the center of mass does not move much at all. That's because it's mainly a fuel tank. And so, yeah. And let's just double check far for safety's sake. But I am going to uh, send this up uncrewed first hence the little able avionics core in the back and in order to do that the able avionics core can only manage point f uh, no, not point five, five tons maybe I should go with the Delta avionics package then I don't have to make the tail look quite the way it does um, was there a good reason not to well it does make the whole thing bulkier I guess we'll leave it as it is. So uh, the capacity of the Able Avionics package is 5 tons, so we'll have to build it without some of its fuel to get under the 5 ton limit. And also that, you know, the efficacy of the test, whether it's a reliable test or not, is sort of called into question at that point, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, so... The important thing, of course, you might be wondering is the engines. We don't have jet engines yet. We're trying to unlock them still. We've only got rocket engines, which is fine because the X-1 broke the sound barrier with rocket engines. In fact, these, the LR, uh, XLR-11. And the good thing about the XLR-11 is that it has four ignitions. The bad thing is it's ethanol and oxygen burning, so not the greatest ISP. And I've had to put two just to get enough power. So that is the idea, but I like the extra ignitions. The total burn time, the possible burn time is six minutes for the XLR11. So here we are only using three minutes and that's uh, when it's fully loaded. Uh, so with one XLR11, it would have six minutes of capacity. Okay, so that is the shape of things. Um, I've called it Dennis because the X1 was nicknamed by Chuck Yeager Glamorous Glennis after his wife and from Glamorous Glennis I got Dennis. So there we are. Okay, so saving this and we will build one. I don't know how long it's going to take to build one. Um, 385 days? Okay, apparently 385 days. What the heck? Oh, because of the build points. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Okay, we will have to add some more build points to the SPH. Otherwise, this is going to take forever. So, let's buy some more upgrade points. We've got, you know, we've got all the advances for all the projects that we've got going. So, uh, it's a bit risky, but I'll, I'll spend them on this. Let's get five points and I'll add that to the SPH. So now it has 0.35. Maybe I'll add another one. Okay. So now how long is it going to take? Uh, SPH, Glennis, Dennis, 85 days. So it'll finish before the trinket one. Okay, well, uh, let's get to it. Of course, we're not going to be crewed on that mission, so it'll just be a test. Okay, and while this was completing, we actually completed mature supersonic flights, so and now we have jet engines. But let's try this out. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's uh, warp to next morning before we try that out. 
and no Bill Kerman. Okay. Overheat? There was an overheat indicator there. Don't know what that's about. Okay, so that... No SAS? Oh, this doesn't have SAS. I'm gonna have to reconsider that, but uh, anyway, it gives us control. Throttle up, no SAS. Two engines that we have to ignite. Okay. I pressed spacebar. Let's try that again. Uh, yeah. They're not working, are they? Feed pressure too low. Ah, they're pressure fed. Okay, we need to have service. Okay, well, let's recover this. And we'll have to have it be a service module or fuselage tank, not not default. Right. I admit it, I, I would have known that, except I had actually used different engines in the back. And those would not have required it to be pressure fed. And uh, I switched engines halfway. Okay. Well, changing the tanks to service module tanks, I could change them to fuselage too, but uh, fuselage would be even heavier. Uh, service module should be okay, but changing them to service module tanks really takes a bite out of our Delta V, because, uh, again, heavier. Um, it looks like we could put fuel in the wings. That sort of helps things, but then our thrust is really getting annoying. Yeah, uh, remove all tanks. Don't feel good about that. Uh, so, anyway, we will get under 5 tons again. This is just a test. We've got jet engines now, but uh, we can't use this format for them because the rockets are only 0.3 tons. Take a look at our normal turbojet here, 1.3 tons. Uh, this one is 2.155 tons. This one is uh, small enough. We could use two of these. But two of these generates uh, 26 kilonewtons, and if we take a look at the XLR11, just one of them generates 26 kilonewtons, so we'd actually need four of these to be equivalent. So that's not great. Yep, so we'd have to have a different design is basically what I'm saying there. Uh, okay, so Dennis, we, we'll try and build another one of them, but... Yeah. Not so good anymore. No SAS. Throttle up. There's an overheat warning. Uh, I don't know what to do about the overheat warning. I think maybe it's because they're either A, too close together, or B, clipped into the tank. Maybe. So what's going to happen when I ignite it? Well, let's find out. Or not. What now? Still not responding to ignition. Nope, can't activate engine either. Activate engine? Nope. Oh, no connect. Oh, no connection to send command on. I didn't realize this thing didn't have any. It has Omni range 300 kilometers. I guess there's no line of sight to to where the connection is supposed to be. Yeah, I, I was planning on this Omni range 300 kilometers to handle the whole thing. Analyze telemetry. Nope, can't send signal. Okay, well, let's just recover it then. Really, this whole let's try airplanes for once thing has turned out to be a total fiasco. Um, trinket one, let's just go with that. Hopefully, the Atlas will treat us better. Hopefully, I mean could be that we should be sticking to the Lancer instead of uh, trying this whole Atlas thing, but we've got the Atlas, so we might as well use it. Okay, here we are, and we can throttle up. SAS is on. Well, there's an Atlas, all right. Don't know what else to say. Let's hope for the best. Okay, ignition. And launch. Goes and off to Smart ASS. We are doing an off plane transfer. This is mainly just a test of the Atlas rocket. 
I think I'll separate the booster engines once we get to 4 G's. We'll see where we're at at that point. Okay. Dropping off the boosters. We're at 0.8 G's right now with the center engine. It should be alright. Pretty stable at the high end of the specific impulse. But as far as how much Delta V we have, I don't know if we have quite enough to get to orbit. It's a good thing that the Agena engine has two ignitions. Yeah, it's in uh, close call territory right now. If I eject the fairings, will they clear safely? I guess there's only one way to find out. Alright, they are clear. That doesn't give us too much of a boost in terms of Delta V. Actually, one thing I did not put in, oh well, two things I did not put on were the vernier thrusters. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't feel a need for them and they're an extra cost. Uh, the engine gimbal's just fine. So, yep, uh, no vernier thrusters. So obviously what we need is like a centaur stage or something to boost the the payload capacity of the Atlas launcher. This was above the payload capacity of just the one and a half stage version. So we'll need two and a half stages. Or we could just reduce the mass of the payload somehow. Not in a great place, honestly. We'll probably have to wait until we're over here in order to burn for the moon. It'd take too long to burn from this node, the ascending node here. Then we'd reach the moon like in uh, three quarters of a month. Uh, how did our data do? It looks like we've got some data there. The Agena engine uh, has a 36 minute mean time before failure. Mod Propellant RCS has a mean time before failure too. That's interesting. The uh, one kilonewton thruster, thankfully, does not have a mean time before failure. Isn't that nice? Okay, six minutes until apoapsis. Plenty of time. I'm gonna throttle down here and yep separation no space junk at least uh, that stage will re-enter and let's test out RCS very good and I actually didn't action group the commutatrons so let's do that extend them Maybe some pitch up. Okay. Are we settled? Yes, we are. Throttle up. And ignition. Alright, that's working. And that's in orbit. Oh, shoot. Hmm. Smart ASS captured my throttle somehow and prevented me from shutting it down quite when I wanted to. But uh, we've, we've got 3,102 meters per second left. And uh, 361 by 183, well, 182 is okay. Now, uh, probably the best thing to do is get a transfer that will cost exactly 3,102, just so I don't have to use the RCS to correct too much, though that's what the RCS is for. Then what fuel we have up here, and let me just lock that right now, uh, just a fuel. Uh, is actually supposed to be to make orbit around the moon is what that's for okay so let me do some plotting well it looks like it'll cost us 3155 to make this burn I don't know if I can yeah I don't think I can do any better so uh, we'll have to use some of the RCS to finish it off hopefully that will be possible but let's aim for this since it's a uh, potential crash, crash core situation, which means it's really, really close to the moon. And that's what we want. Well, maybe. Communication might be a little bit dodgy close to the moon. 166 kilometers there. 
All right. So we've got 43 minutes to wait. Still got quite a bit of hydrazine in that tank. So let's wait. And it's one minute burn time on this stage. In theory, we should be over Australia when we need to burn. I think. Let's see our situation here. Well, we're currently starting over Australia right now. There's another probe up there that we can connect to. Okay, it says very stable, so we will try reigniting the Agena engine. Okay, here we go. And it has reignited. Okay, and we have to use the RCS to finish it off. Let's hope it's enough. Okay, that's good. That is good enough. Okay, now we've got it working for us. Seems to be an imbalance between UDMH and red fuming nitric acid there. Red fuming nitric acid. But, alright, we'll wait until we can see the sun. In theory, we can dump the dump the genus stage. Probably it'll save us some battery life, but let me see how much power we can actually generate. We'll have it orient us with respect to the sun first, so we don't have to use the fuel in the probe to do that. Okay, well, our panels are facing the sun. Sort of. How far have we deviated in our course? Not too bad. 600 kilometers is our periapsis around the moon. Uh, we still got 66 units of hydrazine in that tank. Maybe we should keep that around just to help us out over there. I don't think we're going to run out of electric charge, but I'm not sure. If it looks like we're about to run out of electric charge, then I will... I will, um, what you call it, uh, dump the Gina stage. Mm, okay, now it's looking more like we're gonna lose electric charge. Seven days. We're only nine hours out. Okay. I will dump the Agena stage. Now we don't have so much power consumption. Our trajectory is now way off. <laughs> that uh, kick from that stage, you see. That leaves us with a periapsis of 360 changing. Okay. Let's just time warp then. We are regaining power. Alright, we have reached the moon's sphere of influence. It looks like a periapsis is facing Earth. Let's focus on the moon. Periapsis is down there. Earth should be visible from there. And if we burn all 426, we get into orbit all right. I don't think they require a particular apoapsis. It says periapsis between 20,000 and 5 million meters, but no apoapsis. So it should be all right. And when we do any experiments, we'll be fine. Okay, here we go. Let's just go retrograde. Too bad we don't have a reaction wheel, that could be helpful at this point, but, you know, even semi-magical reaction wheels would be nice. And once things settle down, ignition. Okay, we have made an orbit. It's just a lost stage there. Yes, we have to send that science first. Let's just get into as low an orbit as we can without bringing the periapsis down, though. Okay, that's the end of the fuel. And so, micrometeorite detector, I think we, yeah, we've already done that. I think we've got an orbital perturbation experiment that we haven't done. Indeed, high over the moon's lowlands. 
Well, unfortunately, we are still high, but uh, that would be good enough for the contract. So, lunar orbit uncrewed, contract fulfilled, and science data from space around the moon, contract fulfilled. And we could do more as we pass over other biomes. I guess we could do a little bit more. Let's see now. Oh, I, I've probably action grouped the science, by the way. Let's just tie more up and try it again. Uh, nope. Nope. Oh, this temperature scan high over the moon. Okay. Uh, surface info does not give the biome. Landing uh, does give the biome. Okay. Transmit the Midlands. Major craters. Okay. Major craters it is. Transmit that data. Well, interestingly enough, it seems pretty well balanced on the power. I mean, as long as if we could reorient it with respect to the sun, I think it would recharge just fine. Right now it's nighttime side and it's depleting, but once we get into daylight, let's see. Once we get into daylight, any daylight, and it seems to replenish, re replenish just fine. So we've got permanent satellite around the moon. Oh, now it's turned away from the sun. Again, just a reaction wheel would be really helpful. Uh, I think I, I think I'm done trying to get science for now. We could always, if we're in a desperate situation, we can use this to get more science. But for now, I'm satisfied. All right, so let's go back to the space center. Okay, so I think the next thing I want to do is to get a geostationary satellite into orbit around Earth to fulfill that contract. Test whether our new system is capable of that since it got a probe to lunar orbit. So just using the same thing with the Atlas rocket. Uh, but I've just discovered that I don't have KSC switcher, which is necessary to switch the location to Kuru which would be a good place to launch the geostationary satellite since we have to be under an inclination of 3 degrees. So, I'm going to add that mod in, restart the game, and then see if we can make that launch. Okay, KSC Switcher is in, and I've changed my launch site to Kuru, so I'm going to build another Atlas rocket with a Trinket 1 on top of it and try and get that to geostationary orbit. Okay, I just found out something unpleasant. It looks like the the mass limits for launch pads are set per location. So instead of having the 100 and no, actually 800 ton the mass limit that we had back at KSC, here we don't have that. We have we have a much lower lot mass limit. So we have to upgrade here as well. That seems unfortunate, but, well, I don't want to change my mind about what I can do. And besides, we're already building the rocket. So, oh, besides that problem, we also seem to have the problem that the, the pace of construction is limited. Darn it. Uh, so we can't launch from here, basically. Uh, okay. Okay. I mean, because otherwise I not only have to upgrade the launch pad, but I also have to speed up our ability to build things. I guess we'll just launch from KSC, and then once we get to Apoapsis, we will do the inclination adjustment there. I don't know how much that's going to cost. Probably a lot. Um, yeah, I don't know if we'll make it or not, but it's better than spending all the money trying to upgrade everything here at Kuru. Well, so much for the initial idea. So, less likely to be a success. Uh, here, I'm going to uh, scrap this. Uh, yeah, let's scrap that. And instead, we are going to build it at KSC and see if we can get to geostationary from there. Okay, well, this is sort of annoying. Uh, I went back to the KSC and the launch pad is still not upgraded. Yeah, it looks like I have to spend another 75,000 upgrade points. Upgrade... Yeah, I, I don't see the upgrades. 
Let me just verify that I did switch to Florida again. Yeah, I did. See, we're at Cape Canaveral. That's the active site. But now we're building something that, first of all, we can't launch. But we're also not building it very fast because we don't have the upgrade point supplied. So... I don't know what to do about this. Oh, well, I guess I did have the foresight to zip up my save file before adding KSC Switcher just in case. So I think I'm going to restore the save file and delete KSC Switcher and then try and launch from Cape Canaveral to Geostationary. All right. All right, so here we are back at KSC with the proper launch pad and everything. And I built the rocket in 130 days, I think it was. Uh, incidentally, if you're curious, we are currently at October 6th, 1957. So, uh, well ahead of schedule, if you will. But uh, throttle up, SAS is on. And we're going to try and go into geostationary orbit, though it's not so easy from KSC. So, and I, I didn't think we had quite enough juice as it is quite enough delta V, but maybe maybe not we'll find out all right so everything's go and ignition and launch going transonic everything looking good we are supersonic now Okay, we're past 4 G's, separation, and back down to 0.88 G's with the center engine. When you think about it, Atlas was a really difficult rocket to pull off, I mean one and a half stages with this technology and, you know, ISP peaking out at 311, that's pretty impressive. And of course, uh, paper-thin tanks, that's sort of important. But, uh, yeah, I think we might have some more fun with Atlas rockets in the future. They're just so distinctive. We're just going to keep burning. Uh, we'll start off with the Agena stage, and we'll burn to 35,786 kilometer aquapsis, or close to it. Okay, trying to keep it fairly low on this end, uh, 150 kilometers or so. Oh. Ah, darn it, we got hit by test flight, performance loss. Well, that'll nix uh, about 500 meters per second or more of our delta V. As if it wasn't tight enough already. Okay, well, uh, separation. And ignition. We continue anyway. I don't know if we've done micro, uh, not the micrometer, right? The or orbital perturbation experiment here. Let's see, no, we haven't. Uh, from space, just above Earth's water, have not done it. Okay, getting ready for shutdown. Okay, that's just shy of it, but we can use RCS for the rest. That only leaves us with 800 meters per second to do the inclination correction as well as finish it off. So, that's not great. Oh, come to think of it, I don't even know, I don't think we can, yeah, this is not the right place to do the inclination correction, so I can't do it like that. I would have to, that's why they go into an even higher orbit and fix things. I can't do it from here. Oh well, I guess we'll just see how much delta V we have and use it as a communication satellite. Um, yeah, we don't have enough juice, not by a long shot. Okay, fuel looks to be stable. Let's go. 
much g-forces. Separation and ignition. I should have used the extra RCS delta V there, but it wasn't enough to make the difference. I mean, uh, not 600 meters per second. I'll reserve some fuel so that we can turn and make sure that the solar panels face the sun and everything. We also still can do an experiment. The orbital perturbation experiment is probably doable from out here as well. Okay, I don't know what you call a 14 hour orbit, but that's what we're going to have. Okay, uh, well I can't adjust. Actually, I can't fine tune it with these thrusters like this. Another little flaw. But let's do the science. No, yes, transmit five scientific data. Okay, well, so this is not going to be good for the geosynchronous or geostationary satellite launch. Uh, ironically, it's probably it's probably good for the Mars flyby and Venus flyby, though. I think it'll be all right. But maybe we want a little bit more margin. I'll think about that. But anyway, we did get into lunar orbit for the first time, and we have possibilities to do other things. Let me make sure... Where is the sun? There's the sun. Let's orient this properly. Smart ASS off. Well, it's got some drain like this, but... While time warping, it, it recovers, because uh, the probe goes into low power mode during time warping. So I, I declare this a decent commsat. Alright, so on that note, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.